Start basketball. Hi, this is coach Pascal Meurs from Belgium, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads, wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. It's really trying to expose our kids to experts in each field to give them the best chance they have to fulfill their potential. Alex Sarama joined Elite Academy in Belgium as the technical director in August of 2019 after three years working in the NBA. In his role as associate manager for basketball operations, Alex worked on NBA initiatives across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa to grow the game of basketball. This involved extensive travel to deliver clinics for players and coaches all over the world, as well as coaching within programs such as the Junior NBA, NBA Player Camps, Basketball Without Borders, NBA Global Camp, and the NBA Global Games. Within Elite Academy, Alex acts as technical director overseeing the player and coach development for all age group teams and coaches in the program. Additionally, he is the head coach for the U16 and U18 boys teams. Growing up in Guildford, England, Sarama previously was the founder and director of Goldhawks Basketball from 2011 to 2016. The club was based in Guildford, Surrey, where Alex worked with over 200-plus youth players. We just launched our Hoop Heads Pod webinar series with some of the top minds in the game across all levels, from grassroots to the NBA. If you're focused on improving your coaching and your team, we've got you covered. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash webinars to get registered. After you're finished listening to the show, hop over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and review to help others in the basketball community find the Hoop Heads podcast. If you haven't told a friend or coaching colleague about the show, what are you waiting for? Tell them to subscribe now on their favorite podcast app so they never miss an episode. You can find all the show notes plus every episode we've ever recorded on our website, hoopheadspod.com. Get your notebook and grab a pen so you can take some notes as you listen to this episode with Alex Sarama from Elite Academy in Belgium. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Klinsing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel this morning, but I am pleased to be joined by Alex Sarama from Elite Athletes in Belgium. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mike. It's uh, great to be on and looking forward to talking basketball. Absolutely. We are excited to have you on. Wanted to get a chance to dive into your basketball story, learn more about what you're doing for the game there in Belgium and internationally with all the experience that you've had. want to start out by going back in time to when you were a young kid. Tell us a little bit about how you fell in love with the game of basketball. Absolutely. So this will be fun because I've I've never really had the chance to to share like my whole background into into coaching. I, I did it on a private Zoom call with some coaches the other week, but I think it's it really kind of how I got into the game and my experiences playing, I think it really kind of shaped how I coach now and the philosophy I have. So it it all started for me. I mean, in England, growing up in England, a town called Guildford, a a pretty small town outside London. Uh, Basketball isn't, isn't a big sport in the UK, but um, the, the local pro team in the town uh, called Guildford Heat, they were the, the biggest club in England at the time. And um, so I just I went to a game and absolutely loved it. Uh, I was I was playing soccer and, and tennis, and then as as soon as I saw them play, and, and I started you know doing sessions at my school, I knew that you know basketball was the sport I wanted to uh, to pursue. So that was when I was about eleven or t- eleven years old. So played at school, and then um, because of of how what the structure is like in in England, it's nothing like the U.S. where um, 
you know, sport in schools is, is so uh, established and delivered to a good level. It's it's a club based system. So that meant that the delivery in schools is really poor. So when I got to about the age of 14, I started uh, a basketball club at my school for kids who are younger than me, for the 11 and 12 year olds. Um, and it was from that age, really, that I knew I wanted to coach. I just loved the the feeling and the impact that you could have through coaching and how you could really help uh, help young young kids improve. So I, I started coaching, doing it a little bit more. And then the club that I was playing with, the Guildford Heat, I was playing for their youth sector. Uh, I started doing a little bit of coaching for them. Um, but I had a I really enjoyed it up until I got to one particular team, which was the under 16s. Um, and I, I went from playing an, at a local level, what, what we call local league, to playing national league, which was a higher standard. And I just had a really, really bad experience in terms of uh, the coaching that I received that year. And like I didn't know it at the time, but I knew that there must have been a, a more effective way to coach, but I just didn't know what that looked like or what it felt like to be coached in that way. And now that's what I call transactional coaching. And that's why I'm so big on this whole idea of being a transformational coach. But um, anyway, it was it was really interesting. The, the season finished and um, the Georgian, Jordan Brand Classic event came to my town, which was, I mean, what are the chances of that? And the Georgian, Jordan Brand Classic was for the top 40 um, European prospects at the time, aged U17. So, I mean, there were some big, I remember Mario Hazonia, obviously now a pretty established NBA name. He was kind of a top player there. So as part of the the outreach for that event, they invented um, some local clubs. So I got to go and Gannon Baker did a clinic. And uh, I just, I, I felt like the energy that he was able to transmit in the session. And he was doing all the tennis ball stuff. And you know, I, I don't do that now, but I just think the way he was able to hold a group and inspire the kids, that really kind of got to me. And um, so it was after that, Mike, I was, you know, I was 16 at the time um, and I decided to uh, that I wanted to start my own basketball club. Uh, so I, I basically, long story short, I ended up starting a club called the Guilford Goldhawks. And the idea was to still keep playing. Um, but that, that didn't work out. So I, I completely <laughs> stopped uh, stopped playing with this Guilford Heat Club, and I just really wanted to dedicate myself to coaching. So uh, really, that's when I started this idea of Kaizen, uh, which is it's, it's something I use a lot now at elite athletes, but it's something we talk about frequently. It comes from Japan and, and Toyota, and it's basically this idea of continuous improvement. Uh, what can you do each day, whether it's small or something a lot that you can do to dedicate on your craft to get better? So I was doing a lot of studying. And, you know, I'd say at the time it, it wasn't the most effective things I was doing. Um, a lot of like flashy stuff, tennis balls, two wheel dribbling, lots of like on air stuff. But I still think the essence of the program in terms of trying to be transformational and inspiring kids, it was still there. So. The club started growing really quickly, and I was still at school at this time, at, at high school. So I was, I mean, I was running this from 16, 17, 18, and then I had to make a decision as to where I'd go to university in England. So um, I history had always been what I enjoyed. So I, I ended up going to the University of Nottingham uh, and reading reading modern history, which was great. That's in the north of uh, north of England, kind of mid, the Midlands of England, but. I was doing that, running the club at the same time, and we had some good success with the program. I mean, we were producing in like international players, especially on the girls' side. A lot of we had about ten girls that got picked for England teams, and you know, this was a very new program. I had a team of five coaches who I was employing like full time as an eighteen-year-old, and they'd be going coaching in schools, running the club. So the the university years went well. In England, it's just three years. Um, so I did my studying, going back to Guildford a lot. It was like a two and a half hour train ride. So I was going back weekends to coach, help the club out. Um, and I, I met a lot of people during that time who, uh, who now I, I talk with a lot of people like Alan Keane, James Veer, Ashley Cookson, who, uh, who I actually just started a, a podcast with through EA. Um, and so it was a, a great experience, but it was learning a lot by failure. 
And I, you know, as a, as someone so young, I had no idea how to manage people, how to do finances, but some really good lessons I took from that. And then my last year of university for, you know, moving forwards to that, I, I had to make a decision what I would do. And I, I went to a pretty good university in England. I mean, one of the regarded as one of the top universities there. So there was some pressure to, you know, go and go and get a, a what is considered a, a normal job. <laughs> but I, I didn't want to do that. It had always been about basketball. But, but then an opportunity with the NBA came up. Uh, NBA Europe were advertising for internships. And just so it happened, their, their main headquarters for Europe, Middle East and Africa were in London. So hundreds of people, thousands of people applied. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get one of the internships. And that was in basketball operations and communications, which is basically PR. So I was working across both departments for for six months. And uh, my first opportunity was like two weeks into the job and I was sitting at home on a Sunday evening and I got a phone call from my manager at the time. And he was like, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you come to Finland? And I was like, of course. And (laughs) that was for the basketball that borders camp. So it was, um, you know, scores of NBA players, coaches, personnel there working with some of the best kids in Europe. I mean, countless NBA alumni have, went to that event and basically they they threw me into the fire on the girls side of the camp um vanya vanya cernovich who is my colleague she gave me the chance to uh run the first half an hour of the camp and that was my my big break i prepared for it and you know i I delivered something they liked it and then from then that moment onwards they kind of could see i could coach they trusted me with more so i really was able to enjoy and do well with the internship so they relocated me to madrid in spain after that um had an amazing opportunity to travel the world with the nba i went to i think close to like 40 countries i mean i I never imagined i would end up going somewhere like kazakhstan if if you asked me you know what i'd be doing just the year before that so literally traveled the world doing clinics to the nba junior nba stuff uh learning about the nba business making some great connections but I, I really wanted to show, you know, what my ideas were for youth basketball and have a platform to share all the research that I'd be doing, everything that I'd be listening to, studies I'd be reading, clinics I'd been watching. So I I just wanted to coach as opposed to doing clinics. I wanted to have my own program. So the opportunity came up to join elite athletes slash elite academy in Belgium. Um, And, you know, I think, if, if any of the listeners know, I think it it's kind of the EA program's been going a while and, and the work that Yorick and Ollie had done there had always been very innovative and kind of trying to push the edge of what youth development looks like. So I just figured it would be a really good fit. So took the, I mean, it was a very difficult decision to leave the NBA because had some amazing people working with, with some of the colleagues like Vanya, Henry and, and Neil, who was my boss. He was like a 10 year NBA coach. So it was very difficult to leave, but I felt like I had to do it just because of of where I wanted to go in terms of being able to coach at the highest level. So that's kind of what's, I know that's a long, long background, but a lot of that kind of helps paint the picture of all the ideas I've taken over the years and, and how I ended up in Belgium and in Antwerp where I am right now. All right, let's go back. I want to just circle back to a couple of things that as you were talking, just some things that stood out to me. So first of all, I know you mentioned it a little bit, but when you started your own club, obviously you got into that to do it for the coaching piece of it. But clearly there was a business side of that and trying to figure all that out. So as a 16, 17 year old kid, just talk a little bit about what that experience was like, maybe in a little bit more depth in terms of just trying to run the business side of it. Because obviously you had the love for coaching and being out on the floor with kids and coaching and doing those types of things, but just from a business standpoint, just talk a little bit more about what that was like. Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. I mean, I think one of my my one of my traits is I've always been pretty organized. I think that's seen in in my coaching and and how I prepare prepare things and and just all all of that. I think my organization skills I like to think are reflected on the coaching side, but I think that was really key for the for the business part of it in terms of we were very organized and it was just 
I was I was putting a lot of time in, but the things which I missed out on, I think, were just things which come with experience. And that's more like the soft skills, um, learning how to interact with people, especially, you know, the fact that these are adults who are a lot older than me. Um, I think as you get a little bit mature, especially as I traveled, I like when I look back, when I even with the NBA, when I was looking back at some of the things I was doing, I was cringing just because <laughs> a couple years had made me so much, so much smarter. But I think, you know, the approach I had was the fact that I was so young and, and you know, there were adults who were working in the club. I had to make sure that the, the organization was at such a high level that no one would doubt my age. And also I wanted, it was kind of the reason I got so obsessed with the self-study because I didn't want people to think, oh, this is a 16 year old. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So for me, I kind of just saw it as motivation to learn more, to study more, to get better so that the people wouldn't talk about my age, but more like the qualities and what I was trying to do. So where did you go? What were your go-to sources at that time for trying to learn more? Were you reading books? What were you doing? What was it that you tried to do to improve yourself? I, I think that's one of the hardest things for coaches today, especially young coaches, because there's there's so much, there's an abundance of information out there. And I think it's so hard to have a filter and to actually figure out, you know, especially during this difficult period with the, with the coronavirus. I mean, we're, there's so much all around us and it's, it's actually a skill to be able to look at things with uh, a wider lens and to take in the stuff that is most applicable to you. So at the time I mentioned Gannon Baker, but I, I was really, I watched a lot of his stuff and I just, I, I saw one of Gannon's virtual clinics the other day and I still just love how the energy that he has. And, you know, yeah, I, his I enthusiasm, yeah, I, agree, I agree with you. He's one, just, 100%. he's off the charts on that area. 100%. I think that's a big part of transformational coaching, being able to inspire kids, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily do uh, all the stuff Gannon does, but I think that the base there and, and looking at how you can have an influence on kids. It's some really good stuff. Um, I did get onto Brian, some of Brian McCormick's books at a young age. I think when I was about 16, 17, uh, and I, I speak to Brian quite a bit now, but I think his books in terms of fake fundamentals, they're on Kindle, uh, 21st century coaching that actually inspired me a lot because when I started the club, Mike, I actually started, the gold hawks with uh, a family friend and the first sessions he did i thought they're amazing because it was all these fundamentals you know like zigzag drill two-line passing and i was like oh i wish i had this when i was younger but then when i read brian's brian's books i realized it was actually fake fundamentals you know and we were we were doing all these things in practice which don't transfer to the game so uh that that was a defining moment for me reading reading brian's stuff and then i'd say i was I was pretty lucky in terms of I then started to get onto some of the game's approach ideas, I think, as it was taking off. So that was when I discovered Mike McKay for the first time. And, you know, Mike is, is a mentor to me now. I've, I've been fortunate to spend a lot of time around Mike and, and having conversations with him. So I think I was very fortunate in terms of I was able to get access to some some really good ideas at a young age. I think the opportunity to be able to have those experiences, as you said, when you were younger, because a lot of times I know, and I've spoken about this on the podcast before, just about myself. And I think about when I was 22, 23, 24, and I'm 50 now. So this is a long time ago, but back then I had just come off a playing career and kind of just felt like, Hey, I was a good player. I know how to coach and probably didn't do some of the things that you describe yourself doing at a young age, which gave you a nice head start in terms of being able to figure out what works, what doesn't work, figure out your coaching style. Whereas I look back and I basically just kind of mimicked the coaches that I had as a high school player and as a college player. And that was kind of what I did. And it wasn't because I had studied and analyzed whether or not it worked. Or it was just, that was just what I knew. And at the time, I guess, I don't know if it was arrogance or just confidence that I knew what I was doing, but I just didn't go out and do the things that you described that you did, which is try to learn from people who have done it before and who have different ideas and thoughts and try to put together my own philosophy. And I came to that in life much later than you. And then even through the course of doing the podcast over the last two years, I feel like my education in the game of basketball and coaching has 
really taken off. And one of the things that's kind of been a theme of what you've been talking about is your transformational versus transactional coaching, which is something that any coach who's out there that's done any kind of reading at all has probably heard those terms. But let's just, in your own mind, define for us when you say transformational coaching, define for us in your mind what that means. Absolutely, Mike. And I think just before I, I do that, really interesting point you made. I think, you know, 90% of coaches, they coach the way they coach because of what they had when they were younger. And I think with me, I, I think it was actually just lucky the fact that the coaching I had was so bad. That was what, <laughs> that was the reason I didn't want to coach in that style. Right. Um, so, I, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one. But, um, you know, to answer the question is, is the transform, transformational versus transactional. So to give you some comparisons, I think the transformational coach is someone who focuses on, on vision uh, and the long term in mind. And a transactional coach, it's more short term. You're focused on on winning. And obviously at the pro level, that's very different to the youth level and the context that I'm working at. But transactional is more your coaching and um you're more like reactive in nature and you're using kind of punishment or rewards as motivation. You're like, if you do this, I will give you this. If you like run X amount of suicides, it's you're doing it to try and motivate, motivate the kids. Whereas a transformational coach and what we talk about elite, uh, elite Academy is we're trying to use our charisma as coaches and just uh, being able to inspire the kids through other ways to motivate them. And um, we talk about being role models as a transformational coach. So we're walking the talk. So I've spoken about the Kaizen concept already. And, you know, very similar to what you said about why one of the reasons you're doing the podcast, Mike, to actually learn some new things. Well, I think that, that's a great example of the Kaizen. But um, as if we're expecting our players to, um, to be learning and to be getting better, especially during this period of the virus, we as a staff have to be doing, doing that. So... All the things we're doing at EA is we focus so much on coach development as a whole staff and showing, you know, I think the kids, they they have a growth mindset if they see it in the coaches. Um, and I think if, if the coach doesn't have a growth mindset, I think it's much less likely to filter down to the kids. Then other elements of transformational, I mean, we talk about challenging players to think. And the transactional coach to me is more of a PlayStation coach. And what I mean by that is if, if we're imagining a game is taking place and we see a lot of coaches and, and they're being a PlayStation coach and they're shouting and telling players what they're trying to do uh, the whole time. Pass here, shoot, dribble, dribble, set a screen. And it's like they're controlling a joystick like NBA 2K. And that's kind of what I spoke about on that virtual clinic when I gave the analogy of the orchestra and how a coach needs to be like more like a conductor of a classical orchestra because you know, if, if we started seeing during a great classical performance, the conductor shouting at the violin sections or turning to the clarinets or oboes and telling them to speed up, well, it would ruin the performance. And that is exactly what happens when coaches in a game do the same thing, because we've got to think about how difficult it is for a young athlete to make decisions, you know, especially with the pressure of the crowd, the, the, the situation in the game. And then all, all the a bit, the information they've got to take in to make a decision. You know, is this player open? Uh, maybe it's a ball screen they're running and, and they're tagging the roller. They've got to try and make that decision who's open. Well, if the play, the coach is shouting instructions, information is coming in from the crowd, that's like an overload on the brain. So transformational is we're allowing the players to think for themselves and put them into in situations where they can do that without trying to control and, and influence uh, their mecha mechanism to do that. And then just, I'd, I'd say last things to touch on here. And I think um, something in, in Europe, maybe we need to focus on a little bit more is the inspirational element. And I think in Europe, we are so good on the basketball part, the technical tactical, but I think maybe we, this is where we need to pull a little bit from the States. And this is kind of why I'm trying to balance my coaching between both cultures in terms of having the tech tax from Europe, then having the inspirational and, and the feedback culture stuff that I think some North American coaches are really good at. So I like when you talked about having kids being able to have the opportunity to make decisions, because to me, that's one of the issues that when I go out and I have kids that are my 
my daughter is in high school. My son is uh, a middle schooler. And then I have a daughter in elementary school. So I've coached them at all various levels and go to tournaments. And I, I so often have talked about and seen whether it's coaches on the sideline, just constantly yelling instructions, where to go, do this, do that. And as you said, the kids out there on the floor have a difficult time processing that in real time. And it just distracts them. And then you think about parents that are in the stands doing the same thing. And this is a topic that I've frequently talked about. And I just think that when you try to put yourself in that position where somebody, and in this case, two or maybe three somebodies are all yelling things at you. And then oftentimes they're, they're in, they're not, they're not in concert with what the coach wants you to do. So the coach may want you to do something. Mom's yelling something else. Dad's yelling something. And you're out there trying to play and make these decisions. And it just becomes to the point where the kid is overloaded. And I had uh, John O'Sullivan, who I don't know if you know John at all. But I do he, indeed. Yeah. I went to so, one of his seminars live actually. Okay. And I mean, he's just tremendously smart, but in his book that he just came out with recently, he, when he was on the podcast, he talked about a quote basically that says the intelligence should be in the game and not on the sidelines. And to me, like that line just encapsulated everything that you talked about, which is I can be on the sideline as the coach yelling all kinds of things that I see or that I think I know, but ultimately I can never provide enough direction as the coach to every player out there to get those things to happen. I have to transfer that intelligence to my players through our practices and through the things that we're doing and through thinking through the game and giving kids an opportunity to learn how to make decisions as opposed to me trying to, as you said, be that PlayStation coach who controls every movement of my players out on the floor. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I, you know, and just to add on that, I think when we look at the role of a coach and what good coaching looks like, sounds like, and feels like, it's actually to make your, your role um, more redundant as the coach. Because if, if your players are having to rely on you, well, to me, that means you haven't done a good job coaching because they can't be interdependent of you. So everything that I'm trying to do at Elite Academy is, you know, trying to create performers and, and athletes who can, can self-regulate, be able to perform individually. And they're not reliant on mom and dad shouting instructions or looking over to them for support. They're not reliant on the coach. They can just go out and in the storm of a game, they can execute and perform under pressure. So what does that look like when you're organizing a practice or a training session with a team or a group of players? What does it look like? Give us some, some concrete examples of things that you do that help kids with that decision-making process out on the floor that's going to help them be prepared to react in such a way in a game that they aren't relying on their coach or somebody in the stands yelling things out to them. Absolutely. So I think the practice design is a key component of that. And what I mean by practice design is simply how you, what you, what you're putting in your practice. And that's where small sided games are, are absolutely critical. And I think we're seeing a good shift, especially over the last few years with uh, coaches moving away from the old platform drills, things done on air against, you know, playing, not playing against defenders. And I think people are definitely taking in more of a, a game sense approach now. And for me, that's, that's really important because uh, simply, you know, if you're not creating opportunities in your practice for players to make decisions, then you're not going to see that transfer to the game. So what you're actually putting in the, in the practice is really key, but then how you're giving feedback and how you're actually coaching and, um, I think the basketball bit is that's kind of easy to an extent because anyone now can go on Twitter and get great small sided games ideas, you know, so many good resources out there. But then how you're actually delivering that, that's that's a kind of a different art. And for me, I think something that I'm very self-conscious of is the feedback element. And that means um, when we look at different types of feedback, trying to be a little you know, we, Brian McCormick's got some great stuff on this and he speaks a lot about specific versus general. And so many times we see uh, the general feedback being given. And what I mean by that is coaches saying things like, good job, good job. Um, and they're not actually being specific. What was good about that? And that's what I'm, I'm really trying, that's what I really tried to focus on this year. So I could really be specific to athletes and not always giving feedback to every rep of a small sided game. And there are moments, you know, if, if you're doing that and you're giving a running commentary during your practice, 
Well, players, just they're not going to listen to you and, and it becomes white noise to them. So picking the moments that you, you, you say something, it means that what you say is going to be taken in much more uh, by the athletes. So I, 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 use like the, I use the term delayed versus instant. You know, I'm not giving instant feedback on every rep. I might say it's an individual workout or a team practice. I might let them play a little bit and self-explore, and then we'll do a recap after that. So that's just some different ways that we give feedback. And then as well, you know, the most obvious one in terms of um, instructional versus open and questional. So using questions to try and probe a response from the athlete and um, open versus closed questions. So an open question would be more stuff like, how did that feel? What did you see there? What, what was the reason you made that decision? Um, I think those are just some really key probes that the coaches can be asking to kind of prompt some of this stuff. So how intentional do you have to be with that as you're going into a practice or going into a season or thinking about for a coach maybe who's trying to change the way that they give feedback? Because I know that if I don't go into a practice with the idea that I want to coach and ask more questions or I want to make sure that my feedback is specific I've been as guilty as anyone and I think it's very easy to fall into that trap of the good job the non-specific type of feedback or a lot of times as a coach we want to say here's what I saw here's what you should have done rather than as you said ask that question and what I find is when I'm consciously thinking about the things that you just described then I do a really good job of it if for some reason I lose my concentration as a coach or I get unfocused. Sometimes I go back to maybe those old ways of doing things. So just for yourself, do you have to constantly have that in the forefront of your mind that I've got to remember to give specific feedback? I've got to remember to ask questions. Just is that something that you go into every practice with or every training session with the idea that that's the type of feedback that I want to provide? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when I when I realized that I needed to get better at it, that was – I think October, November, kind of early season, I was I was being sure to remind myself of it each practice. Um, and what's really helped me is just micing myself up. Um, so, I mean, you can buy an audio recorder for like $50 on eBay and Amazon. And all I do is I mic up every practice and games as well. And then I just, I get all the audio because the audio is actually, I find the audio more important than the video. And the, uh, this is just uh, some advice my mentor, Mike McKay, gave me. He, he visited um, me in Belgium in February. He was with Team Canada that just played some of the FIBA World Cup qualifiers in Belgium. So we spent a week together. And um, Mike was just like, you know, Alex, you should really mic yourself up consistently and then just play it back when you're working in the day. So what I do now is just uh, after delivering a practice, say I'm, you know, doing emails the next day or I'm practice planning or even, you know, doing something like cooking or driving, I'm, I'm actually just playing the practice back or the game. And that's really what makes me self-aware. Uh, but I, I have noticed that since I'm doing that, my self-awareness has shot up just because of the thought that the, that the microphone is there. And then a, another way to do it is, I think this is a great way to kind of build, build trust and confidence with your players, is just being vulnerable with them and telling them, um, this is what I want to get better at. So at the academy, we've, we're just introducing something called an IPP, which is an individual performance plan. So every player um, has their own IPP of stuff that they need to work on. Um, and it's just the rule of three. So it's three things max. And it's really specific. So it could be something like shooting off the twist. Um, it could be something like making the, the right decision versus a drop coverage and pick and roll. So basically the first you know, a few 10 minutes of every team practice, players are working on their IPP. But then the idea is with our coaches, we're going to do our own uh, IPPs for coaches. So what is it that we as coaches want to get better at? Because, you know, what um, what I'm going to do, I'm coaching on the 21s next year. Um, I'm going to get the players to present on their IPPs to each other. And then I'm going to present on mine. And I'm going to be uh, being vulnerable with, with, with my guys and, you know, the, the some of them, I think, will, will go on to have good pro careers. I've got some pretty talented guys. I think they'll go on to some decent levels within Europe. And I'm just going to be like, this is what I need to get better at. And if it is feedback, I would tell them that. And then we would have a relationship where 
if you know in a practice session if i'm not being specific if if i'm not being you know conducive with the feedback i'm giving we have that relationship where they will just tell me and i think that's the best way to regulate and uh and just be open with your players i love that there's two things one what you just said kind of goes back to something that you had spoken about earlier which is the need for you as a coach to model what you want to see in your players so if you're going to ask your players to have that growth mindset and grow and put together an ipp well then it's clearly important for you to do that as a coach and as you said by you showing your vulnerability by you showing your players the things that hey i'm not perfect these are some things i need to work on i think that can only continue to engender that respect from your players because they see you in the trenches with them doing the same thing trying to improve and get better and then i go back to it's funny because right when you started talking about changing and being intentional about doing asking questions the way you were coaching then my next question was going to be have you ever videotaped or taped yourself and then you went right into you know talking about that so that was perfect so my question related to that then is when you first mic'd yourself up was there things that you were surprised that you heard that you didn't realize maybe you were doing as much or as little as you actually were when you listened to that for tape for the first time or two Oh, all the time. And I think it's, that's, that's part of the journey is as a coach. And I mean, there's still so much like when I'm playing stuff back, which I know needs to be better, but at least now I'm self-aware of it and I'm trying to address it. And to me, I think it was things like, um, it was actually too spending too long sometimes to set, uh, to explain like a small sided game or a drill that we're doing and just talking for too long. And then, you know, I'm seeing the time tick by on that record and I'm like, geez, this, this has to be better, <laughs> Alex. Um, and then some things which um, I had a, I had one of the players on one of my teams this year who um, who really struggled to understand concepts and it wasn't his fault. He was um, in, in Belgium. We've got two languages. We've got a, a French and a Dutch part and we're in the Dutch part. And he was coming from the French part. Um, great kid, but coming from the French part. So he was learning Dutch and English at the same time. Uh, plus, you know, he was he was one of the younger players in that group. So a lot of the concepts that I was doing, I mean, it, it was like speaking Chinese for him. And, right. you know, he really improved throughout the season. But I, I didn't do a very good job being transformational with him at certain points. Like I would assume, I'd assume it would be easy or presume it would be obvious. Um, and, it, and it really wasn't. So... I think that was an experience that actually helped upon reflection, make me uh, a little bit, a better coach, you know, and I think it's knowing how to manage players who need a little bit more time to maybe learn a concept or something. I, I think that's really important and things which appear obvious to you as the coach, I can guarantee they're not obvious to a, a 14, 15 year old kid. Yeah, no question about that. And then I think that, one of the best skills that you can have as a coach is something that you just talked about, which is the ability to deliver information in a clear, concise way in a short amount of time. Because we all know, as you said, if you stand up and you explain a drill or a concept and you're going to talk for two or three minutes, by the time those two or three minutes are over, you can guarantee that 95% of your players are staring up at the ceiling or looking around and they've completely tuned out to what you're saying. And if you can accomplish that same thing in, 15 seconds or 20 seconds and explain it i think that's a huge piece of it another thing that always seems important to me and just tell me if this applies to what you're doing but i always think that one of the most important things a coach can do is to make sure that you have terminology and names for everything that you do so that you can quickly say okay everybody we're going to jump into drill x and everybody immediately knows what drill x is as opposed to all right we're going to go into that drill where remember this is what we do. And I, I just think that terminology and making sure that you have names for everything you do is so important. Have you found that to be the case at all? Yeah, 100% on, uh, on terminology. And I think it was just an interesting thing you were saying about talking too long. And I think a good thing that coaches, if, if you're, you know, you're fortunate enough to have an assistant coach, just have them time you when you're making an intervention or explaining something. And I think, Something that we did was if it got to 45 seconds and I was still talking, my coach would give a trigger word and it could be anything. And we used something I stole from Mark, uh, Mark Bennett, a uh, great UK like performance uh, 
sports coach who has some really good, good ideas. And we just use the word pineapple. So if I was speaking for 45 seconds and it went over that time and my assistant coach felt that uh, it was going on too long and it wasn't something and, and it was unnecessary for me to be speaking longer, they'd just say pineapple. I'd stop talking, would go into it. Um, I think it's a, it's a good ex- tangible thing you can do as a coaching staff to kind of look at that. But I mean, going to the question of terminology, I am, uh, I am, I, I consider it to be very important for sure. And we have a glossary that we expect all our coaches in the age groups and in, in all our age groups, some under 12s up to U21s to be using because, you know, it just doesn't make sense for kids to be going up age groups if they're, you know, they've got new concepts to learn. And if they're having to relearn words, well, that's just not not conducive, like productive whatsoever to the athletes. So um, as the technical director of the academy, um, I consider it to be really important that we will speak in the same language. We give the glossaries to our kids to learn. And then something we've just started doing to kind of teach it to them in a fun way is I'm sharing clips on our social media platforms. So our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and I'm using our terminology and using it to describe the clip. So, I mean, coaches listening to this, just check out Elite Academy Antwerp and, and you'll see some, especially on my Facebook too. And I basically just give a short description in a couple paragraphs as to what we're seeing. And then the key buzzwords in there, I define at the bottom of the post. And it's just a really fun way to kind of um, McKay talks about hiding the carrots in the spaghetti sauce. Well, that's a good example of that. We're kind of showing them something fun, but at the same time, they're getting a chance to learn and, and speak our language. Yeah, I think that's critical, especially as you talk about youth players. And so often we forget, I think, as coaches that basketball is a game and it needs to be fun. And too often I'll see coaches that they're so focused on I don't even know what you'd call it, but it's just they make it where the game is not fun. And I think if you can figure out a way as a coach to make sure that your players are engaged and that they're having fun and that you as yourself as the coach are having fun. And yet you're still being able to teach them those decision making skills and the skills that they need from a technical standpoint to be able to perform in a game. Then I think you're really getting into that transformational coaching that you were talking about where the kids see you as the coach having fun and putting the time in and then they consequently, because you put the time in planning and coming up with your drills and your activities and your practice plan that is going to be beneficial to them as players, but also is going to do it in such a way that the kids enjoy it and love it and want to come back to me as a youth coach. One of the most important things that you can do is to instill a love of the game in a young kid, because we know if a kid falls in love with the game of basketball at age eight, nine and 10, they're much more likely to stick with it and work harder and practice because they love the game, not because their coach is telling them to or their mom is telling them to or their dad is telling them to or their friends. It's because they have this uh, innate, intrinsic motivation to be able to continue to play. And to me, that's so critical as a youth coach. Yeah, I 100% agree with all of that, Mike. And I think, you know, in, in Europe, from a European perspective, I think in the, the countries where basketball is not number one, i.e., quite a few countries in Europe, that is where, where soccer is number one and basketball is, you know, second in most of those and, and lots of other sports. And there's lots of competition because these sports are played year round. And I, I feel like in some countries like Serbia or Lithuania, you, you don't necessarily that enjoyment side, maybe it doesn't, it's not always there because simply the basketball is number one there and the kids aren't going to drop out and do another sport. Whereas in Belgium, where I'm coaching, obviously this year, especially in the UK, where I'm from, if it's not fun, kids are just going to go and play another sport. And then you're losing that kid to uh, potentially you're losing that kid from basketball for life. And that's why being a transformational coach and everything that we've spoken about in this podcast, you know, using small sided games, making the experience fun for the athlete. Well, if we're doing that, we're going to have more people playing our sport for life, which is obviously the goal. Absolutely. Which goes back to, I want to circle back to your experience with the NBA because I just had a couple things that I want to touch on and then we'll get more into how you ended up getting connected with the guys at Elite Athletes. But let's talk about your NBA experience. And I know you mentioned that you had been to over 40 countries. So when you think back to that time, was there any country or experience that 
was surprising based on maybe what you thought before you went to that country? Just maybe share one or two, not even necessarily basketball experiences, but just cultural experiences from the opportunity to travel uh, to different parts of the world that maybe a lot of people haven't gotten a chance to go to. Just talk about maybe one or two transformational country uh, experiences that you had. Absolutely. So, I mean, Ettore Messina, one of my coaching idols, he, he appeared on, on the Immersion podcast and he spoke about how travel is kind of like number one for exposing you to new ideas and, and self-development. And for me, it was, well, I can see, can see it completely what he means. And I'd say first, just living in Spain. I mean, Madrid is what an amazing city Madrid is, but then just being able to see some of the cool things done in Spanish basketball. I mean, I was doing, I did, my last year, I was coaching a group of under 10, under 11 girls at a school. So not even the club, just at a school. And some of the things that they're encouraged to do, like passing with one hand, um, like underhand finishes. And these were 10-year-olds. And it's like just that pure creativity. I think it was, it was so cool to see that. I mean, at EA, we talk now about basic amazing and how I think so many coaches have the idea of fundamental skills. and they have this idea of fundamentals completely wrong. And to us, like a fundamental is not a two hand chest pass, which you hardly see for us would be like a, a fundamental could be a one hand no look pass because it is fundamental. You have to be able to do that, especially at the highest level, you know, say you're in a pick and roll scenario, you're trying to deceive the defense with your eyes. That's a critical, critical skill you need to play at the highest level. So I think just living in Spain, just seeing some of that creativity and more just the, the friendliness of Spanish coaches. I mean, I was at this club, Toro Ladones, and they invited me to their 50th anniversary event. And Toro Ladones was one of the top four youth clubs in Madrid. So they competed with Real Madrid, who I'm sure everyone's heard of, and then Estudiantes and Fren Labrada, two other good ACB clubs in the top league. Um, and the coaches and the sports directors from those clubs came to this event of Toro Ladonas to celebrate the success of the club. And I sat there and I remember, because that was in my first three months of being there in Madrid. And coming from the UK, where the sport was so politicized, I was just like, this is amazing. I, you would never see this in England and seeing this level of openness between coaches. And I think just that ability to share and it's, it's just, that's, that, that was something really cool. Um, I mean, just in a nutshell, really quickly, other, you know, just being spending time in Lithuania and Serbia, that was just amazing just to see the basketball culture. I mean, it's like I remember going to I was doing a player camp for um, Valentunas, Jonas Valentunas, when he was with the Raptors. So I landed at, at Kaunas Airport and I was driving to like the middle of nowhere to this place called Druskaninkai. And uh, I stopped off at this gas station to, to top up. And there was like this massive like shrine to the Lithuanian national team. And it's like huge poster of um, <laughs> Sabonis, their, their president, De, you know, Demontis Sabonis, his dad, Avidas. So that was just amazing to see that, especially coming from, from the UK where basketball is so small. Um, and then just really, you know, I think I've taken a lot of ideas from Italy. I've got some very, very close Italian friends. I speak with... I probably speak with coaches from Italy more than any other country in Europe. And I, I just love how they teach the game. Um, and I mean, I have a pretty romantic view of Italy anywhere I study. I specialized in Ven Italian and Venetian history. So as a, as a whole, I like it. But as a country, I like it. But I love the basketball too. I think what you just said, those stories speak to something that I probably knew before I started the podcast, but it's become completely clear to me after having done this for nearly two years. And that is just the openness of coaches and their willingness to share with other coaches, with other people, to help one another learn, to have that growth mindset and to just share the game and help grow the game. I think that's something that has come across so loud and clear to me, the number of people that have been willing to come on our show and just the number of people that I've seen, whether it's online and doing research or just reading and doing things, people are so willing to share in today's day and age with each other. There really isn't anybody out there anymore who 
is trying to keep secrets of, oh, I got this great new thing that I'm developing and I'm not going to share it with anybody because I don't want anybody stealing my ideas. And I think even if you wanted to today with the internet and social media, just the interconnectedness of all of us throughout the world makes it really almost impossible, even if you wanted to, to keep those things from everybody. But I found that the coaching world is just so open and willing to share. And to me, that's one of the best things about basketball coaches, I think in particular, it's just incredible the amount of sharing that goes on. I think that's what you're describing your experience was like when you were working for the NBA and just going to all these different places around the world. Yeah, 100%. And I think as well, Mike, you know, you can learn from anyone. And I think the biggest thing when I was traveling was it was keeping an open mind and any any coach, whatever level, like we were as a youth, U12 coach to a, a pro coach, regardless, I'd always try and have conversation and just soak up whatever I could. Uh, and I think, you know, that is the great thing about this game, the sharing piece, which you mentioned. And I think it's one of the things I value the most now. You know, I've got coaches, I've got friends in in countries all over the world. And I think that's that's why I love the game. It's one of the main reasons. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the wider your network is, the more different ideas and different thoughts that you have to come in contact with. And I think one of the things that I always find to be interesting and fascinating is you'll have conversations with coaches and there'll be somebody who maybe even the concept of what they're talking about or what they're teaching is the same as something that you do, but maybe they just use a, a slightly different phrase or a slightly different way of describing it or the wording or vocabulary that they use is different. And all of a sudden you just grab onto that and you're like, oh, that really makes a lot of sense. Like I'll give you a good example. There's a coach here in the United States, Jason Zimmerman, who coaches at Emory University. And I heard him speak at Jay Billis' camp last June. And he was just talking about how he ran his transition offense. And he told his players on the wings that, you know, you always hear coaches say, we got to sprint the lanes and we got to get down the floor. And his terminology was, we don't sprint the lanes, we race the lanes. So he tells his two guys, you've got, we're racing. It's a race to get to your spots down on the offensive end of the floor. And I had just never heard anybody say it that way. And I came away from that and said, that's something that from this point forward, I'm never going to say we need to sprint the lanes. I'm always going to just say we need to race the lanes. And those are the kinds of things that that was nothing earth shattering. It was nothing revolutionary, but it was something that just clicked for me and made a ton of sense. And I thought if I'm a player, sprint the lanes. Okay. I guess I kind of get that means, but if I'm racing the lanes and I'm racing my teammate on the other side of the floor, I get that. That's going to motivate me just a little bit more. And I think that kind of phraseology and being able to pick that up from so many different coaches, especially for someone like you who's had such extensive international experience, you just are exposed to so many more different ways of even looking, like I said, at the very same concept, but just looking at it in a different way. Yeah, I think great point, Mike. And I'd say Ross McMain's New Zealand um, national team assistant coach, he kind of opened my eyes up to this with the terminology and, and spe especially giving, like the example you just mentioned, with the race to lanes, giving your terminology a name, which actually makes sense to the athlete and is somewhat um, similar or represents the action or movement they're doing. So something like we, we talk about something very similar, we call it a bolt. And that's one of Ross's terms. So it's simply running the, the floor at the speed of Usain Bolt. So we just call it bolt. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. You know, there are so many little things. If I took our glossary, our terminology, we've really tried to match things up so it, it makes sense to the kids and it's easy for them to remember. And I think that's the, that's why I'm loving youth coaching right now. I mean, eventually I want to coach at the highest level. That's my goal. But I really think that it makes makes you a better coach coaching at the youth sectors because, you know, if you're trying to get a 13, 14, 15-year-old to understand you, well, I think – that's that's great because then any you know that anyone's going to be able to understand you at any level if you can do it and it works with with young kids. Absolutely. Have you ever thought about putting or maybe you have put together, a, for lack of a better way of saying it, a dictionary of the key terms like a bolt and put it yeah put it down, put it down on paper. Have you ever done that or thought about doing it? I've done it. So um, I you know I just completed. I've been at EA eight months or seven months now. 
And part of my role this year was I wanted to get a feel for the Belgian basketball landscape. And then I've devised a whole strategy of playing based on a lot of the research I've been doing this year, countless hours on synergy, but then just watching a lot of games in Belgium. So I've come up with a style of play and a strategy for how our elite academy players all the way from U13 to U21 play and trying to get them ready for latest trends that we're seeing in the game. And so that means I've done, so I've got like an 80 page document on how our offensive concepts like a, a smaller one for defense then we have separate documents for how to teach all that with video playbooks and then the glossary is one of the last resources and i just finished the glossary properly about well, a month ago but it's essential because you know any coach that joins our program now and say i don't know say i was the coach in the ncaa in years to come or uh, pro league or whatever any coach that is is joining i can instantly give them the glossary or a player and they can they can kind of we can speak the same language and i feel like if you're joining a new coaching staff when you don't have that i think it's a lot harder to feel a part of the process and to be able to be confident giving feedback if you're not sure as to what the language of the program is so i i consider it to be an essential task for any head coach and yes it takes some time but i think it's all the, all the better for it. And I think as you do it, it was a great task because I was really learning stuff as I was making it. And I benefited from it from a selfish perspective as in terms of having to think and come up with stuff which is going to make sense for the kids that we have. Yeah, absolutely. I can see where it completely clarifies your own thinking. And then I love it from the standpoint of, yeah, it also helps with onboarding coaches and making sure that everybody in the staff is on the same page but then you also share that with the players. And now collectively, our team, our club, our group, however you want to look at it, we now have this collective bond, this collective language that only we share, which just, again, makes it more special to be a part of that group, that team. And I think the more you can create that special environment where kids, players, coaches feel like, hey, it's it's an honor to be a part of this. It's a, It's special. It means something to be on this team or to be part of this club, the more things you can do to inspire that type of feeling, I think the better chemistry you can build, the more camaraderie you can build amongst team members. And ultimately we all know that when you have a team that is together in that way on a personal level, that they tend to come together more as a basketball team as well. Yeah, completely, Mike. Completely agree. All right. So let me ask you about, how you got connected to elite athletes. Just kind of give us the story of how you ended up getting connected with the guys there and just tell us that story of how you ended up there. Absolutely. So, I mean, when I mentioned about the club I started, Goldhawks, right back in the first few minutes of this of this podcast, um, I mentioned how I was lucky to meet a lot of influential people during my Goldhawks years. And I actually met the EA guys during those those years that I was running Goldhawks. And um I actually went to a coaching clinic in Belgium with um, some of my club coaches. It was Rob, Christina, and then um, Alan Keane, uh, GB U20's national team head coach. And we went, the four of us, to this clinic. And um, sitting behind me, it was Yorick from EA and the whole EA crew. So it was about eight of them all wearing their EA gear. Um, and I'd seen some of their stuff on YouTube. And it's funny, like, seeing the old stuff, it was... It was all the stuff that we do not believe in now, like parachutes, hurdles, speed ladders, all of this stuff. But right. they, they'd already had some success with like some of their videos had like a million views or whatever on YouTube. So I'd kind of known about them, but we just started talking, got on really well. And then we exchanged contact info. And then, you know, four months later, they we I brought them to England to run a camp. And that was their first ever international event for ea outside belgium and it was a really good success we had about 60 kids take part in this in this camp that they ran so we ended up we did like three more camps during the years i joined the nba we kept in touch ea actually came to one of the basketball borders events to coach and run some of the skill and athletic development stuff so we stayed in touch and i think it was it was just a natural fit really i mean as they were growing they were they 
the aim of the academy is to do something like no other academy in Europe. It's a very, very different model. I think very transformational, but then it's it's very innovative. Um, and I just figured like it was a perfect fit. All right. So then give us an idea of when you say innovative and you say that they're trying to do things differently. Just give us an idea of if you had to sum it up in a couple of paragraphs, just tell us what Elite Athletes is all about. Just give us an uh, overall general philosophy of what you and the club are trying to do. Sure. So it's it's really helping athletes to recognize their full potential. I think just the way we are unique is we have a very specialized approach to coaching. So we have basically, as opposed to having one or two coaches working with the same age group, which is the common approach in Europe, we have a team of specialist coaches. So we have the, the team practices, which uh, we call TPP, so team performance plan. Um, then we have team practices, which are individual focused. So all the players are there as one team, but they're working on individual skills. And that's like an IPP type practice. So I lead on the TPP side of the program, all the strategy concepts some tactics, but obviously there's a great deal of skill in there as well. But then Yorick Michaels, he leads on the IPP side. So we have a team of three skills trainers that do those practices. So every academy team, it depends on their age and their period in the season, but they it's not just one practice, which is the same. So like for instance, the U16s would have two team TPP practices and two IPP practices every week. So obviously that's they're, they're working with real experts in that. And then we have, so that's two types of sessions. The other two types we have are strength sessions and movement sessions. So the strength sessions, you know, everyone, everyone does that. That's, that's the standard like strength and conditioning, but we do things very differently because we have a guy called Olivier uh, Goodkaluk who really is, he's a world leader in, in his field. And we focus a lot more on the movement side of basketball than the strength. And we really feel like where the game is going is we want to have athletes who are great movers. And it, it doesn't matter if they can bench, you know, X amount. If, if they're not a good mover, that means nothing. So Ollie does a lot of um, dancing, rhythm work, working on body coordinations. We get, we get like opera singers in to do sessions with our guys. We get dance instructors in. We get boxers. It's, we, it's, it's, there's so much we do there. So it's really trying to expose our kids to, to experts in each field to give them the best chance they have to, uh, to fulfill their potential. Do you feel like that kind of stuff also helps to not only train them as athletes, but also help to keep them engaged because it's something new and different that they're seeing all the time as opposed to, as you said, like the old standard strength and conditioning stuff where everything is the same all the time by providing oh, that variety. Do you find that keeps kids engaged? 100%. And it's like the fact that they have each week, they come into contact with like 10 different coaches. I mean, it's, I think it's the kids love the Academy. And I think one of the reason why like the retention rate is so high uh, is, is because of that. It's fun for the kids and they know it. It's, it's good for their learning. Absolutely. Give this an idea. So here in the United States, I'm just trying to wrap my head around sort of what your program looks like day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. So maybe just give us an idea, an overview of, you know, you mentioned, okay, we have two team practices a week. We have two skill development practices per week. Just maybe give us an idea of, let's say, what what a week in season looks like and maybe what a week in the off season, quote, off season looks like so that people have a better feel for what it is that you guys are doing on a year round basis. Okay. So we periodize the whole year. So we split it up into um four different topics. So we have postseason and that's kind of like our active recovery phrase as soon as the, the season finishes. And it's just three weeks of passive recovery. So this typically coincides with their exams. So it's it's just we play different sports, no basketball. So three weeks they don't touch a ball. What time um, of the year is that typically, Alex? That is typically May and June. Okay. Um, so then after that, um, you know, and it, it's a KYP, know your player situation. Some players, if they feel drained, well, they're going to take longer. Maybe it could be four weeks or five weeks. Um, some players might be ready to go after three. So it, it, it depends. 
But then, you know, when the postseason finishes, we go to our off season, and that's that's just a focus on individual skills. So that's that's like your individual packages, like passing, finishing at the rim, um, a little bit of soft touch stuff. Could be maybe some basic pick and roll concepts, but not getting too tactical. Um, shooting is a heavy, heavy part of that. Shooting is the master skill. Um, so then off season takes us in it's like june and july and then late july and for the whole of august is our preseason, and that's we take all the kids away so we spend a week with them on a retreat and we do a lot of our culture building then with olivier so kind of setting the academy standards we watch cool documentaries together we read books together it's just it's like a really nice retreat quite a bit of meditation and mindfulness done uh done by ollie during that period so and at the same time we're having our our team practices then so we're really like introducing um some of our tactical concepts to the guys and then do you do that do you do that on site or off site so one week is off site and then the other three weeks are in antwerp which is our our town so it's we typically go we go to the netherlands we're going to the netherlands this season for like a week so the whole academy it's like 80 kids but it's just so nice to building. We call it the brotherhood, which is like the vibe we have. And it's, it really helps build the brotherhood. Um, so then that kind of leads nicely into the season and the start of the season. And that for us runs from August until uh, early May. So it's quite a long season. And so how many days a week then are you seeing the kids? Are you seeing them seven days a week? Sure. Just so describe what that looks like. In season, it, we have it, typically it's four practices a week that we have. But those practices are divided by the categories I mentioned. So, and it depends on the age group. So, and the time in season. For instance, September, it could be like all teams are doing more TPPs, like actual team practices versus the skill stuff. But to give you a, uh, an insight as to how it looks, so under four teams, they do one TPP team practice and then three team practices, but as the IPP, so just individual skills. U16s, it's two and two, so two TPPs, two IPPs. And then from U17s upwards to U21s, it's three team practices and one individual. And then for the, throughout the whole program, they get three strength slash movement practices a week. Um, but I mean, that's just, just the base, to be honest, Mike. We, we have a school partnership, so we have I think that's something quite rare for clubs in Europe, but we've just developed a partnership with a school. So we can, some of the kids that go there, we can see them in the mornings for some like extra movement or shooting work. But then we we, we do have our own facility, which we're really lucky because that's quite rare, I think, for programs in Europe. So a lot of kids come just to get shots up or do extra workouts if they have time. During your season, so depending on the age group, how many games are your kids playing over the course of a season? I'd say I think it's something between like 30 to 35, everything. So that ends up being I think one it's like one game a week. One, one game, game a, week. a week. Yeah. Got it. Got it. that's I including think... some tournaments that we do where it's like multiple games. We only do like one or two of those a year though. Yeah, I know that's one of the big debates that we have here in the United States amongst coaches and with our youth basketball system is the fact that just as an example, in our spring, which we call, quote, our AAU season, you'll have teams that maybe you'll practice once, twice a week for an hour and 15 minutes. And then every weekend they'll be playing five, six, seven games in a tournament. And there's this thought of what's that, what's the proper balance in terms of the training side of it, the practicing side of it versus how many games you play. And I know that's a debate that you know, there's sort of this divide between what the American system is versus what the European system is. And so often, and the more people we've had on the podcast talk about how the European system is so much better for developing players because you're just in a practice setting more where you can really be working on improving your game as opposed to, I just have limited practice sessions and I go out and I'm just playing all the time. And I think there's a balance to be had. And we've talked about with other coaches one of the things that's different about basketball today versus when I grew up playing 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is just that kids don't play as much pickup basketball as they did, which kind of goes back to what you talked about as a coach sitting on the sidelines and just kind of letting the kids 
play without getting instruction. I think about most of my upbringing in the game of basketball was just playing and just figuring stuff out on my own. And so I think it's an interesting just debate and trying to figure out what the best way is for developing players. But I think if we hear, if I hear you talk and just think about the things that you're doing and how, what I know about player development, it just seems like putting the kids through a system like what you guys are doing there with elite makes better players as opposed to I have an hour or two of practice a week and then I'm just going out and playing games. So I, I'm sure that you're of the philosophy that what you guys are doing in terms of training is, is, is ahead of maybe what we're doing here, especially at the youth level, at least in the United States. So, yeah, I think your insights are so, so true, to be honest, Mike. And I think when we look at the influx of European players in the NBA, when I was my three years with NBA Europe, it was really exciting because we were so excited to, to see all the European guys that were coming through and the record numbers. I think it was something like 61. I could be mistaken, but that was I think that was the figure in my second year there. And the reason why is undoubtedly because of the skill level. And you look at a lot of these players and just obviously you've got your exceptions, the Yanises of this world. But if you take mo you know, the 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 typical European player, the reason why they're in the NBA is just because of their skill level. And the athletes that you have in the US, I mean it's it's incredible the the level of athlete that you have. And I completely think that if the youth development was done the right way, we're, and obviously, you know, people say there are no right or wrong ways in coaching. What I mean by that is probably, you know, more more evidence-based approaches, i.e. using small-sided games, more of a modern approach. I think if, if youth development was done in that manner in the U.S. consistently and players spent time on that as opposed to all the time that they spend on AAU, you know, leading to uh, all these injuries that we see and just kids not having a chance to work on some of this stuff. I think it would be incredible just to see how the level of, of players would, would go even higher. And not, I'm not necessarily just talking from an athletic standpoint, but more just skill. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. I think one of the trends that I'm hoping is going to catch on and it was maybe going to start to gain some traction with the Olympics, which obviously was canceled for this summer, but got pushed back to 2021 is the advent of FIBA three-on-three being added to the Olympics. And I just think that when people see that game, that it's so fast-paced and it's so much fun, and it obviously is a small-sided version of five-on-five basketball, but there's just so many more touches and opportunities. And I've kind of had an opportunity to be involved in some three-on-three leagues and getting a chance to participate. We've talked a little bit about our experiences at Snow Valley Basketball Camp here in the states where they play a version of a small sided game called cutthroat which is kind of like a continuous you could play it four on four three on three and to me when i see those games played out and i see one how much the kids enjoy it how many opportunities they have both offensively and defensively to be involved in the plays to be involved in the decisions that are required within those games i just think man if we could get our young kids playing more of this type of basketball and getting more opportunities to be coached in this environment, as opposed to having eight year olds running up and down a 94 foot court where the vast majority of their time is just spent jogging up and down the floor instead of playing basketball. I just think it's a huge, huge, it would just be a huge advantage and our youth development system would be so much better if we could get that done. Yeah, com completely. So you know, we'll see. We'll see if that if that can happen because obviously that would require a literally a momentous shift in the game. Absolutely, um, from a lot of powers to do that. No question. So, no yeah. question. I think USA Basketball is trying to take the lead on that. It's just it's such a difficult environment here in the United States, simply because youth sports has become such a huge business that you're fighting against all these institutions and adults and businesses that have an interest in kind of keeping the system the way it is. And so I think as we move forward, USA basketball is going to try to take the lead and it will be very, very interesting to see how much, how many inroads they can make to try to get that system changed around and, and get it to the point where it's really about what's best for the development of our young players and not so it's best for the wallets of people who are involved 
uh, on the business side of it. So I want to finish up here, Alex, by asking you about just your career goals, your career plans, and, and what you hope to accomplish in the game of basketball moving forward from a coaching standpoint. So, I mean, I've, I've been using this break to actually reflect and think about that quite a bit, Mike. And firstly, I've got so much I want to accomplish with EA. I'm so happy, like, what we're doing. And I, I genuinely want to have a really positive impact on, on the youth basketball world in particular with, with some of our, our ideas and what we're doing. So I'm certainly, like, for me, this, this is by far the top priority right now. Um, and, and spending the next few years to try and take EA where I think we have the potential to get to. And I just love it because coming into contact with so many coaches, you know, coaches like yourself and just being able to talk and share the game, it's, I just love it. I mean, I'm still really young as a, as a coach. I'm 24 years old. Um, but to have, have the chance to kind of have my own, I guess, footprint on the program and to have that, have that impact, it's something I really enjoy. Um, plus it's a nice way to travel. I mean, we do, we do quite a bit of international stuff. So really, really happy doing this. I think eventually, I think it was just natural. It will come to a point where with my coaching, maybe I might want to look at the next level up from, from the youth, youth environment. I just, I don't know what that looks like right now. And I think for me, I mean, I've been so obsessed with this idea of trying to learn everything and know it all. And it's just, it's not realistic just from a <laughs> pure health benefit it's it's not attainable so for me i just want to be in an environment where i'm happy as a coach and where i i can have an input i wouldn't want to be like I, I used to think it was like nba at all costs especially when i was with nba europe it was like get on an nba team at all costs but then i was like you know it's if that's not going to make me happy if it's not the right situation the right environment and you know and it's Plus, it's just it's so tough, you know, to get there because there are so many great coaches. So, I I don't really I can't really tell you what where I'm going to see myself in ten years because I just I just don't know. Um, I don't know where the game's going to take me. But I think as long as I can I can have basketball and be comfortable doing it as a full time job and be happy wherever I wherever I am in the world, then that's that's what's most important to me. I think there's two things that stand out for me from getting an opportunity to talk to you here for an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, however long we've been going. And that is one, just the desire that you have to continue to learn about the game. And that to me speaks to the fact that whatever it is that you end up wanting to do, whether that's at the youth level or whether that's at the NBA level, the fact that you're a student of the game and this goes not just for you, but for any coach, I think if that's the case for anyone, you're going to continue to get opportunities because you're going to continue to work at your craft. And so I think that's something that is critical. And it's a great lesson that hopefully through this podcast that coaches out there that are listening are hearing that the amount of time and effort that you put into improving yourself as a coach goes a long way to what you're going to end up being able to do in your career. And then the second thing is just, I love what you said there at the end about being happy. And so often we get focused on these external goals or things that we think we want or things that maybe people around us say we should be going after that might not necessarily make us happy. And I think ultimately what's most important is that you find the right level for you as a coach. And for some coaches, that's the youth level. For some coaches, that's the NBA level. And for many, it's levels in between. But I think that Ultimately, if you're a student of the game and you find a position and something that you're happy in and that you can continue to grow and have input, then you're going to end up being in the right place at the right time. And so I think it's been a very enlightening conversation today, Alex. I've really enjoyed getting a chance to talk to you and learn more about what makes you tick and, and what's going on there with elite athletes in Belgium and how you're putting together the program there and just helping us to understand maybe the difference between the system that you guys have in place versus the system we have here in the States. And before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to share your contact information, share social media, website, just ways that people can reach out to get in touch with you. If they want to have a conversation, find out more about what you guys are doing. And then once you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap up the episode. Great. Thanks, Mike. So firstly, thank you for the opportunity to, to have this platform. Um, 
So for, for coaches looking for more information, my social media handle is just Alex J Sarama on Twitter. You know, very open to, to talking with, with coaches. Uh, I, lo- I love to do it. And our website is www.eliteathletes.be. Alex, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to jump on with us and share what you've learned about the coaching profession and share your journey. I think there's a lot of valuable lessons that you've learned along the way that you were able to share with coaches. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Coaches, we've teamed up with Coach Tyler Whitcomb so you can now purchase his exclusive new playbooks right from the Hoopheads Pod website. If you're looking for ways to improve your team next season, these playbooks blend affordability with the quality content that serious coaches are looking for. Just visit hoopheadspod.com slash store and you'll find playbooks from John Calipari of Kentucky, Leonard Hamilton from Florida State, and Mike Young of Virginia Tech. Check out these great resources at hoopheadspod.com slash store. Hey everyone, last year at the Junior NBA Summit, I came across an amazing company called iSport360 and its founder, Ian Goldberg. Their youth sports app gets coaches, players, and parents on the same page. Your team can set goals, share player feedback, training videos, sticker rewards, player evals, and practice assignments. All of this to foster a healthy team communication and culture. If your team or club struggles to keep open lines of communication, especially among team parents, iSport360 can help. If you want to empower your athletes to have more success, more confidence, and more communication with their teammates, give iSport360 a try today. Shoot me an email, mike at hoopheadspod.com, or give me a call at 216-392-4059 to learn more. Being without basketball right now is tough for all of us. So we've partnered with ProSkills Basketball to offer you a 50% discount on their ultimate shooting guide and video program that will put players on a guided path to becoming the best shooter they can be. With one year's worth of workouts that includes games, drills, and competitions, players will gain access to a blueprint showing them what it takes to become an elite level shooter. If you're looking to improve your shooting at home, this program can help. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash store to check it out. Head Start Basketball.